In chapter 20, we started the first half last week. It was a bit technical. I hope you're okay. But there are people that really do say, God got so mad at the Jews. He said, you're out of here. And he's going to turn all of his promises away from Israel onto the church. It's just not so. So we went into a a great effort last week to show you not only is God not done with the nation of Israel and his people, the Jews, but he is very specific on laying out exactly what's going to happen soon after the rapture of the church takes the church away. So we looked at that last week, and so let's get down in chapter 20, let's get down to verse number 19. Remember, Palm Sunday was just a few days ago. They were laying the palm branches down. You're the Messiah. Hosanna. Save now. And then he stops the whole parade, as you know, and he weeps over the city. And folks go, well, what's that about? Many people know that Jesus wept over Jerusalem, but it seems like there's very few who know why. Had Israel received Jesus as Messiah on that day, the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign, prophesied in all the Old Testament prophecies and New Testament stuff, would have begun on that day. But he knew that because of their rejection, if they rejected Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives, you know the significance of that, on 173,880 days to the day that Daniel chapter 9 said that he would be standing there. He's on there on the 10th month, the 10th the tenth day of the Jewish month of Nisan. Very significant. Exodus chapter 12. That's the day you were to select your Passover lamb. He's on the Mount of Olives saying, what about me? And where did Ezekiel see the glory of the Lord leave Jerusalem? From the Mount of Olives. It was all there. Oh, and he's riding on a donkey. You mean an Uber? No, a donkey. That's a a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, verse 9. He's screaming Levitically and prophetically and biblically, I am so the Messiah. And for a second, the people seem to embrace that. But what always happens when Jesus moves in his kingdom power? The religious people say, you know what? What you're doing and what you're saying doesn't measure up at all what I thought Jesus would do. And because Jesus often um, disappoints the expectations of people, that's when many check out. And they did on that day. He didn't kick out Romans and start the millennial reign. He cleansed the temple. And as a nation, Israel went, yeah, you're not our Messiah. We catch him now after that rejection on Palm Sunday, and he's traveling back and forth from Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. By the way, keep this tucked back in your mind. Right before Palm Sunday, remember, he stopped at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. They were good friends of Jesus. What did Jesus do right before he showed up on the Mount of Olives on that Palm Sunday? Oh, that's right. Lazarus was, do you remember? Dead, way dead. In fact, Jesus waited about uh, four days because in this region at this time in the spring, it was very warm. And when something died, give it four days, it just might stink. That's rather crass, Jesus. No, he wanted everyone to know this is not Lazarus swooning and somehow being revitalized in the coolness of the tomb. He was dead. Accompanying Jesus on everything that we're going to read here today, who's standing right next to him? Lazarus. Who, in my opinion, (laughs) is one of the most effective witnesses in the scripture. What do you mean? There's no record of him saying anything. He didn't have to. He was not dead anymore. Can I get a little amen for that one? Is there, is there any one of you that like, well, I don't know, maybe all the P's and the Q's and the exactness of prophecy this and scriptural that, but I do have this. You should have seen me before Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. 
So here we go. Chapter 20, verse number 19. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him. But they feared the people, for they knew that he, Jesus, had spoken this parable against them. Do you remember the parable, what it was? It was, hey, there's a vineyard owner. And he made a vineyard, no small task there, but he had to go away for a season. So he hired some vine dressers to look after his vineyard. He went away. And he kept sending his messengers, but then they were beating them up, the vine dressers, tossing them out. Finally, the vineyard owner says, I'll send my only son. Surely they will receive him. And what did the vine dressers say? The hirelings, they said, ooh, here comes the heir. <laughs> Let's kill him. And then the vineyard will be ours. So they did that. And then Jesus asked, what do you suppose that vineyard owner will do when he shows up to his own vineyard who killed his own son? Well, said the Pharisees and Sadducees, I suppose that that owner will treat them miserably. Yes. What was that a parable of? The vineyard, according to Isaiah 5, is Israel. Israel is God's vineyard. Who are the people that God the Father kept sending to the vine dressers or religious leaders? The prophets. They killed most of them. Finally, the Father says, I know what I'll do. I'll send my only son. And as Jesus is making eye contact with the crowd, but they killed him. Is Jesus going to be on a cross in just a few days? It's not a stretch to probably think that of this listening crowd of Pharisees and Sadducees and also a group called the Herodians, it's not a stretch to think that the Apostle Paul, well, he wasn't the Apostle Paul then, but he was a Pharisee. It's not a stretch to imagine that Paul is actually in this listening crowd. That's going to set up an interesting question here in just a minute. So we just got done <clears throat> with the parable of the unrighteous, selfish, and really sort of um, wanting it all for themselves, the vine dressers. What did Jesus say? God's going to take that vineyard and he's going to give it to a nation. That's an indication meaning Gentiles. That's Jesus saying, I'm going to take my prophetic attention and method that I've been moving through Jewish people people and Israel, and I'm going to make them blind in part for a season. And I'm going to take that vineyard, so to speak, God's mission and ministry, and I'm going to give it to whom? The Gentiles, if you will, the Gentile church. Now, says the Apostle Paul, this is amazing, not, it's neither and no longer slave or free or man or woman or Jew or Gentile. How many can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Anyone, anyone. And so for a season, God has set Israel aside, but he's not done with them. You and I are living in what's called, what, um, what um, come on, brain, you can do this. Chuck Missler. How many of you love Chuck Missler? How many of you, he kind of makes your brain hurt just a little bit sometimes. He's an engineer by training. But anyway, Chuck Mistler says, we've been living in the great parentheses. We've been living in a time when God says the 69 weeks of years, Daniel chapter 9, that was done. That's that 173,880 days to the day thing that I told you about. Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. That 69 weeks of years is done. There's one more week of years, one more seven-year period left. That's going to be the book of Revelation. And here we are in the meantime. This is the church age. God deals with and through the church in a different sort of methodology than he does when he's working through Israel and Moses and what have you. So here we are now in the church age. Well, how long is this going to last? Paul says, it's pretty simple, there's going to come a time when the fullness of the Gentiles is done, and then when we're done, 
something spectacular happens. He blows a trumpet, a shofar. Shofar, show good. It's going to be pretty awesome. He's going to blow the trumpet, and then all of us who are alive, whoop, we are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be pretty amazing. We are suddenly transformed into a new body. By the way, that resurrected body, who got the first one, the first prototype? Jesus did at his resurrection. So we're the next group of people that are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Whoosh, we rock it out of here and our clothes slump to the floor. What, uh, socks inside his shoes, uh, hip replacements clanging to the pavement. It's going to be awesome. All our little fillings, ding a ling a ling a ling And if, if somebody is standing next to someone that is not a believer, standing next to a believer, what a dramatic moment that'll be. You know, when everybody has that ring doorknob thing, you know, that you can on your phone see who's at your door, all the cameras that are up everywhere, can you imagine the stunning video that's going to surface? Well, how is the Antichrist then going to explain millions of people suddenly disappearing? I don't know. But the Bible says he's going to spin a whopper of a lie. It'll be so convincing. That even the non, that almost all of the non-believers are going to go, okay, that makes sense. I don't know, what's that going to be, aliens? I don't know. Extra dimensional creatures, Michael? What do you think? I don't know. Could be Democrats running wild? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, mess- I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I should have said Republicans so I won't get a lot of emails. Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> when the fullness of the Gentiles is full... The number in the mind of the Father has been reached. Out goes the church. Those who are alive and remain, those that have died before us, they get rocketed up out of the dust of the earth as well. And we in our brand new bodies live with Jesus for the next seven years. Why? Because on earth, God is going to return his prophetic movement through Israel one more time. So this is kind of the place we're going to catch Jesus. He's going to give us lots more details starting next week in what's called the the Olivet Discourse. The disciples are going to ask him blankly, point blank, about what's going to happen at the end times. It's going to be a fun study. But before we get there, let's go ahead and finish up here because there's good stuff to be seen. Verse 20, so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. Matthew chapter 21 on this section says, this group was mostly made up of Pharisees and a group of people called the Herodians. King Herod the Great was an awful guy. He was the guy at the very last year of his life He ordered the death of all the babies born in Bethlehem. Why? Because he had heard that the Messiah would be born there. And the wise men show up and they say, we're here to see the king, you know. And Herod's all, I thought I was the king. So they went, oops, you know. And so they left and the angel, they followed the light and and then they found exactly where Jesus was. So Herod says, what's this Messiah thing? So he calls his Jewish scholars in. Where was he to be born? They said, piece of cake. Um, um, Malachi, pardon me. uh, Oh, my brain this morning is so having a hard time. It's an Old Testament book that starts with M. Micah, thank you. Did you send that to me mentally, Michael, just then? Is that what that was? Micah chapter 5, Bethlehem. That's one of those specific prophecies I was telling you about. So Herod the Great sends his his terrible henchmen there and they kill all the babies. He dies soon after and then you have his knucklehead sons taking over. Well, anyway, the Herodians, as you might imagine, were people who were devotees of the political structure. Rome has now in control and has been since probably about 60 B.C. after Emperor, after General Pompey came and, and sort of ruling the roost now. So that's why there's Roman soldiers parked at every intersection. 
So the Herodians, who are sort of uh, politically astute, they're cozying up with the Romans. So you have these elite religious conservatives joining in with these liberal political uh, chameleons. Talk about opposite ends of the spectrum. They can't agree on anything except Jesus. He's not Messiah. Verse 21. Then they asked him, saying, Hey, teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but you teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Remember who the majority of the crowd is. You have the elite, religious, conservative Pharisees. And because many people were commanded to regard Caesar as a god, that would be idol worship. And they, of course, would, would raise their nose at that. If Jesus were to say, yeah, pay those taxes, you know, then they would say, aha, blasphemy. Well, who else is in the crowd? You have the Herodians. If Jesus says, don't pay your taxes, then they could have him arrested for political insurgency. So you, th you see how, how, um, how crafty they are? But notice how they frame the opening question. Jesus, you're so awesome. By the way. Well, anyway, first of all, <clears throat> a word about flattery. Anything good that comes from me <laughs> was inspired and empowered by God. Can I get an amen on that one? Because the Bible says, left to ourselves, the human heart is exceedingly wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? Well, Dr. Phil knows it. Well, uh, there are highly trained people and professionals who certainly have a sort of an intellectual leg up, I suppose. But the Bible says very, clean, very plainly, very clearly, we sort of think we know what we want that will make us happy. Uh, and then when you get it, you're all, huh. How many remember Christmas? You want that toy? Want that toy? And then it shows up. Whee! And then 20 minutes later, what are you playing with? The box it came in. It's, it's a fascinating thing. So first of all, a word about flattery. If there's anything good comes out of this coconut, I'm telling you right now, it was inspired and empowered by God. He deserves the praise, not me. Good place to write in your margin here, Proverbs 29, verse 5. I'll read it to you. A man who flatters his neighbor is actually spreading a net for that neighbor's feet. Because by transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. When someone is complimenting me, Keep this verse tucked away in your pocket, especially if they're like glowing praises to you while other people are listening. Proverbs 29 verses 5 and 6 says, don't buy it. They're setting you up for something. There's something, some selfish motivation. And uh, Chuck Swindoll used to say, he said, I learned a long time ago. In fact, he said, my dad shared this one with me, Chuck Swindoll. How many of you love Chuck Swindoll? He said, his dad told him, be careful, son, when someone's patting you on the back because they really want you to cough something up. <laughs> That's kind of how it goes. Also, the Pharisees, remember, they bristled at paying taxes to Caesar. And so the Herodians are listening and leaning in. Is he going to say, don't pay your taxes? And so they both thought, <laughs> we got him. This is not an honest question. This is a setup. And Jesus knew Proverbs 29. Oh, good teacher. You're so awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 23, but he, Jesus, perceived their craftiness. And he said to them, why do you test me? Show me a denarius. So everybody got in their pockets. A denarii was roughly a coin that equated to about a day's wage. Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? And somebody answered, they said, Caesar's on the front. Verse 25. Then he, Jesus, said to them, well then, 
Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Hold your finger here. Let's all go to Romans 13. You knew this was coming. Romans 13, everybody, the book of Romans. <clears throat> Romans 13. By the way, uh, let me just read actually a little bit and then I'll tell you my by the way thing. Are you in Romans 13, everyone? Look at it. Paul says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Am I reading that right? By the way, um, be subject to, that's your word, hupotazo. It's the same thing that the Bible says that wives should be subject to their husband. Doesn't mean mindless drone. It doesn't mean slave or doormat. It means it's a recognition that there is an authority. Uh, God sees to it that all of us are under authority, if you didn't know. Because he knows that humans, left alone to themselves, can get into some wacky places. So that's why he gave you that difficult boss. <laughs> Him, her, they're not even saved. I know. But of all the people that could be your supervisor or your boss, God says, this one's perfect for you. What? Because very often, if you notice, the thing I hate in that guy so much, ooh, he bugs me. If you're honest, the Holy Spirit may go, <clears throat> dude, that's you. Uh, again, I'm going to quote Dr. Phil. And Dr. Phil says, Boy, I hate it when my shortcomings show up on somebody else. I don't think he actually talks like that. It was just kind of a stretch, yeah. Boy, do my sins look awful on somebody else. But that word for subject to is the same thing that wives are to come under, so to speak. Uh, that is to say, they are supposed to recognize that God has placed an order in the family. We're going to see here in a minute that the man-woman thing was God's design for some very important purposes. But let's get back to Romans 13. Let every soul come under the authority, be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist, except Nancy Pelosi, are appointed by God. <laughs> Apologies if you voted for Nancy Pelosi. I use it as a cheap joke. I mean, if, if it's dangling, if it's low-hanging fruit, you know I'm going to go after it. But is there a political person in power that you can't stand? Probably, no matter who you voted for. Here's the point. They didn't get to their office or their place of authority except by whom? God did. Whoa, whoa. You're going to take that to a guy like a Hitler or a Mussolini or a Stalin? Conservatively responsible for over 20 million deaths. And someday soon, the Antichrist himself, the answer is yes. Then what in the world would God be doing with something like that? I don't have the ready answer, but the Proverbs are full of when a leader is righteous, the people are blessed. When a ruler is awful, the people groan. And we here in America have been given a tremendous blessing. We get to vote for our political leaders. Did you know that in the last election that um, fewer than 50% of born-again evangelical Christians turned out to vote? Check it out, George Barna. George Barna Institute. For all the squawking that Christians may do, it seems that less than 50% of them showed up to the polls. Oh my. And that is an advocation of a great ability for us to send a, a biblical voice to our representative government seats. If you're not registered to vote, Harvest, please, would you get registered to vote? Would you get educated on the details and the platforms of the various candidates? Because here's another very important truth. When a society 
more and more stiff arms God and his word. God knows that the stubbornness of people sometimes only responds to when God shakes and rattles their culture. True story. Ask those living in Jerusalem about the time of Jeremiah. They were literally wearing, as I've said before, they were wearing their letterman's jacket with a big J on it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, we're God's people, God's city. We're awesome. <laughs> he would never judge this place. Did he? Yes, because God is way more concerned with your and my eternal place than he is with our country. This is a powerful thing. One more time. Verse one, let every soul. What does every soul mean? Mm -hmm. If you're in every soul, can you slip a hand up real quick? That's what I thought. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. He's doing something. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment to themselves. Judgment meaning uh, if you blow past the uh, stop sign and you get pulled over for a ticket, you're going to get a ticket. I'm late for work, but you get a ticket. Oh, I'm, I'm in such a trial and tribulation. Well, you broke the law. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Well, then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. How many of you are so glad that there are police men and women on duty 24-7 to protect you? Praise God for that. That's a God-given an ability here. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath. You know, you'll get a ticket or you'll get arrested. But also for conscience sake. Verse 6. For because of this you also pay taxes. Who pays the salary typically of our first responders? The, the, the tax system does. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs are due. Fear or respect and honor to whom honor. The point of that is, even if you don't like the political pundit that's operating or, or that's occupying the seat, should you be tearing them down on Facebook? What does Romans 13 say? Don't you dare. You can by all means talk about perhaps political policies, what have you, but we are always to respect those that God has seen that are in authority over us. No more water cooler bashing of whoever it might be. Back to Luke, please, chapter 20. So this is kind of what Jesus is talking about here. Show me a denarius, verse 24. Whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar. So he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And then uh, right there, Romans chapter 13. By the way, we are to respect all authority until they break the higher authority of God's word. Example. Pharaoh says to the Jewish midwives, man, these Jews are pumping out babies like crazy. They're going to overrun us with population. He orders them to kill baby boys. And the maid servants, they said what? Nope. Aha, that is civil disobedience. Yes, because Pharaoh, who is their authority, is their authority until he is commanding them to break a higher authority. Thou shalt not kill. Does that make sense? One last thing, and I'll get, and I'll get off of this one. But uh, there are times when husbands who are less than sensitive and oftentimes not very understanding of the scripture. Wife, you do A, B, and C because God's word says you have to. Well, let's go rob a bank. And I'm your authority, so you better drive the getaway car. Well, we are under a covering until what? Until that covering 
demands or compels us to try to do something that breaks the higher authority of God's word. Everybody good on that? All right. It's kind of quiet in here, but uh, don't worry, Mike. We're going to get to some fun gender stuff here in just a minute. Verse 26. But they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people, and they marveled at his answer, and they kept silence. I wrote my margin here. Coins belong to human authority, but people belong to God. Amen. Verse 27. Then some of the Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection, they didn't believe in really anything supernatural. They didn't believe in angels or demons. They didn't believe in heaven. And they really didn't believe in the nonsense of bodily resurrection. But look at them. They're going to step up to the plate here and try to give Jesus a big curveball. Then some of the Sadducees, who deny that there even is a resurrection, they came to him and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife, his brother's wife, and raise up offspring for his brother. That is citing the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verses 5 and 10. Now, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife, but he died without children. And the second took her as wife, and then he died childless. Then the third took her in the like manner, and then all the way up to seven. Seven dudes married this woman, and they all died. Yeah, I'd check her cooking out or something's not right here. All the guys are turning up dead. So they left no children, and they died. Verse 32, last of all, the woman died. Now, therefore, verse 33, in the... <laughs> Snicker, snicker, resurrection. Ha. Whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as his wife. Hmm. Remember, they didn't believe in this. They're doing two things here, really. They're trying to show the ludicrousness of this idea of resurrection. How stupid is that? And they're trying to make themselves look smart, erudite, and, and learn it and make Jesus look stupid. Um, in Matthew 21, Matthew gives us a bit more of the details. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, Sadducees. You know that the Pharisees aren't fair, you see. And, ne and the Sadducees are, well, you get it, they're sad. You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Ooh, these who had often committed entire sections of Scripture to memory, you don't know what you guys are even reading. Now, God's Word clearly teaches that God's power can raise the dead. Here's a couple. What about 1 Kings 17? Elijah raises the widow's son, Zarephath. Here's another one. Elijah raises a Shunammite woman's son in 2 Kings 4. And one of my favorite stories... Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 13, it's a bizarre story. Some enemies of Israel had run a campaign into Israel near Jerusalem. But the, it was going badly for them. So they were sort of running away. But their buddy gets wounded. And he's so wounded that he eventually dies, more or less, in their arms. But they're on the lamb, so they got to get rid of him. So you know what they do? They find the sepulcher, and they chunk their buddy's dead body, and he lands at the bottom. He's dead. It doesn't hurt him anyway. But his dead body happens to contact one of the bones, dry old bones, of Elijah. And touching his bones, bing, the guy suddenly resurrects from the dead. <laughs> How cool is that? Thanks a lot, Phil and Frank. You left me here. I'm alive. Hello. Now, there's some wonderful theological reasons for that, uh, but I'm not going to tell you. You're just going to have to get the video. What are we selling that video for? $99.95. No, it's free, of course. But here's the point. Are there resurrections in the Old Testament, Mr. Sad, you see? Verse 34. Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age currently marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age, an age of resurrection, after you get your new bodies, 
Jesus got the first new body. The church at the rapture is the next group that get their new bodies. Who's after them? At the start of the millennial reign, a thousand year reign of the Lord, Revelation 20 says, believing Israel gets their resurrected bodies and all of the tribulation saints, those who died in the midst of the tribulation, they get their new bodies. Then we have the thousand year reign and then at the end of that, then, this is interesting, then all the rest of anyone who ever died ever, they get their new bodies. Only their new bodies fit for eternity will spend that eternity apart from God. You see, they live their lives not wanting God in their lives. So God gives them an eternity of just that. Oh, if God is such a loving God, how could he send anybody to hell? Well, point of fact, he made hell not for people, but for fallen angels. But people will go there. Yeah, he's such a loving God. Why does he let that happen? He already did everything he could to keep them out. What more could Jesus have done? Who is Jesus? He's a great philosopher. He's, a, he's a, an ascended master, a higher thinker. Well, he was God who zipped up a human suit. He said so. I created all the heavens and the earth. That's another thing that's a distinguishing mark between biblical Christianity and all the other religions of the world. All the other religions in the world, Mohammed, Joseph Smith Jr., Charles Taze, Russell, whoever you want to look at, they never claim to be the God who created everything, right? We're just a prophet. We're just telling you what we heard. Jesus, in no uncertain terms, said, I'm the God who created all of this. Think about that. I created. You remember Genesis 1, verse 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was me. And if you think about this with a logical sort of mind, there are only three options as I can see them. Number one, you're a liar, dude. Another one would be maybe he believes it, but it's not true, so he must be a lunatic. He may pass a polygraph test, but he's no God. What's the only third option? He is exactly who he says he is. And he goes, I know that's tough for people to sort of put on mentally, so I'll give you a little help. Watch this. I'm going to let myself be killed publicly, violently, and obviously. That spear through the side of Jesus, that blood and water poured out, a forensic, a forensic doctor would say, you don't carry that much clearish liquid in your body anywhere except when your heart is in such distress that there's fluid that builds up in the, what's called the pericardium. It's a membrane around the heart. And if the heart is stressed enough, like any muscle, it will tear. And when that spear went up through Jesus' side and blood and that was pericardial fluid a forensic pathologist would say, Jesus died of a ruptured heart. True story. That Roman spear may have done more for your faith than you might imagine. Jesus was dead. Dead, dead, dead. The Romans were pretty good at their terrible task. They're not going to let him off the cross until he was. Jesus said, I know it's tough, but watch this. I'm going to let them kill me. And then three days later, I am going to raise myself from the dead, walk around up to Starbucks and order my medium macchiano. Is that even a drink? I don't know. Vinte, macchi Vinte macchiano. I'm probably saying something very bizarre. Imagine if you saw him in the Starbucks line next to you in three days after you watched him brutally murdered. No other religious option provides that kind of forensic, 
archaeological and historical footprint. There was a man named Jesus. He taught, he was killed, and he rose from the dead. You have to encounter that. You have to process that. If you are in any way an honest skeptic, a truth seeker, you have to go into the idea of Jesus' resurrection. How are you going to fit that into your paradigm? I know. I just won't listen. La, 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 la. There is no resurrection. Well, you can't do that. All right, back to our story. Let's get down to now verse 27. So whose wife is it going to be? Huh? And so he said, therefore, he said, he said, verse 34, Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given into marriage. We know that. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age, you are resurrected either the seven-year tribulation throughout the seven-year tribulation or the thousand-year reign of the Lord or after that in the new Jerusalem, you will have a new body. Now here's a description of that. And the resurrection from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels in that they are sons of God and being sons of the resurrection. When God first created the Garden of Eden and all of the perfect creation, there was not one thing wrong with it, not one thing. The Bible also describes that the lion didn't eat other creatures. There was no carnivores in the garden. Everybody ate herbs. Everybody was an herbivore. And then he created Adam. And remember how he did it? He lumped together some of the humus or some of the living material that all things are living up, that are made up, that are made out of. And then there's Adam. Now, I'm going to get a little weird on you, so uh, hang out but, uh, and hang loose, but if God says that he made man in our own image, the, um, the um, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's in the book of Genesis, Genesis, let us make man in our own image. Adam, was he male or female? I'm kind of asking you, is God male or female? Yes. yes. <laughs> that's the right answer. What do you mean? Male and female is a distinction that God called together in the Garden of Eden. When Adam was first born, I don't know anatomically what he might have looked like, but his spiritual and emotional makeup was similar to the Lord. I believe that God is the attributes and abilities and sensitivities of both male and female. Have you been cruising through the scriptures and you see a kind of a masculine sort of flavor to the Lord's response? Mm. Um, have you been cruising through the scriptures and since God's, for lack of a better term, feminine attributes and responses? Here's what he did. It's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper uh, that is going to, that is going to compliment him. Why didn't God lump together another lump, breathe into that being, and have two Adams looking at each other? Hello, Adam. Hi, Adam. Do you remember what he does? And if you've been with us a while, here comes my hands. He took out of Adam what? Eve. And ladies, have you ever noticed that much of what women are, men are not. Guys, much of what guys are, women are not. One is not better than the other. One is not smarter or more capable than the other. They're just different. And that's how God did it. And God says, and I'll say it in a shorthand sort of way, my precious sisters, have you ever looked at your spouse and thought, you wouldn't say it out loud, of course, but I think there's something missing with mine. You are right. True story. In fact, I like what John Corson says. Wives, be careful of the enemy whispering in your ear, saying that thing that he never stops saying about your spouse. He's not as deep as you. He doesn't respond to the deep relational issues that you long for. And I believe that there's some handicap. That's not the right way to say it. 
I believe that there is some truth to that. And I want to hasten quickly. There's only one man who ever will. Jesus Christ. Dudes, brothers, can we talk? You, you and your spouse, you see the same thing and you have your dude response. And then your wife is kind of doing what she's doing. A little part of you goes, Pfft. react much, do you? Why did you even react that way? I would have never reacted that way because she's different. That's not where you go. The enemy's all, I think you got a broken one. Maybe you should hunt on Facebook for one that's not as broken. Oh, do you understand, husbands? Wives, do you understand that men and women are different? Not one better, not one worse, just different. And my precious sister, Ask the Lord, if this is sort of new information for you, ask the Lord, what is it like to be a woman, a scriptural woman of God? What does it mean to, to um, hupotazo, to come under and to support? What a concrete and steel foundation does for a building, that's the wife for the husband. A completer. It's not a worse job, it's just a different one. And the Bible goes on to say, and Paul will say later, there's something absolutely profound. And brothers, please listen up. There's something absolutely profound and awakens in your wife's heart and mind when you, the husband, are walking closely with Jesus Christ and walking closely in obedience to his word. Is a woman capable of stepping up and setting the spiritual tone for the family? Yes. And too often, they are forced to do so. They do a fine job. But is that God's best? And there's a little bit of resentment that the enemy can fan the flame to a woman whose wife, to a woman whose husband doesn't lead that family in the Bible, perhaps devotional times, maybe um, communion, and has not set the bar and is content for the wife to take all the kiddos to church. That family is out of balance. Husbands, please hear me. She is designed by the Lord to respond to your protection, your spiritual walk, if it's close with God. And there is something that is so fulfilling when she really has the opportunity to relax and not have to steer this family, spiritually speaking. True story. In fact, uh, Paul will say, he'll say that the husband is kind of a reflection of his head, Jesus Christ. And the wife is the reflection of her head, the husband. Now, that doesn't advocate a woman from her own responsibility to walk with God. But I'm just saying, if I'm feeling ornery enough at times, when I'm sort of tired of a husband in a counseling setting running roughshod over her wife, and she's this, and she always, and she never, you know. And if I'm feeling ornery enough, I'll say, well, congratulations. Thought, what? You had a strong hand in making her that as she responds to you. What? That's usually when they get up and they say, give me my money back. And I say, I didn't charge you anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm out of here anyway. So many husbands and wives are upside down because they don't understand Brothers, do you know what it means and what it looks like to be a man of God, a husband of God, a, a, a father of the, like the, in the same pattern as the Lord? Wives and husbands, if you know what God has made you and designed you to be and find your design, I'm telling you, you don't need a marriage counselor. If you are, search me, oh God, try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. You don't need a marriage counselor, I'm telling you. Anyway, I think we beat that horse enough. Let's get back to our scriptures. 
How many of you like that idea that our new bodies will not have a gender? They won't. We don't need it. We'll have, we'll all have the best attributes of both genders here under the sun with none of the liabilities. How many of you can't wait for that one? <laughs> Jesus goes on, he says, um, well, then we're at, um, where'd I go? Oh, here I am in verse 37. Ooh, we better get done here. Verse 37, but even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. Remember when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive today. Currently, they are disembodied spirits, along with every believer in Jesus and Old Testament saints. They are currently with the Lord. There's coming a day when they'll get a new body. Verse 39. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. But after, they had da- after that, they dared not question him anymore. You have spoken well. And so they start uh, putting together their next line of attack. Verse 41. Then he, Jesus, said to them, How can they say, I got a question for you. How can they say that the Christ, he would not have said Christ, Jesus probably would have said Mashiach. He probably would have said Messiah. How can they say that the Messiah is the son of David? Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, and and he's citing Psalm 110, verse 1. But the psalmist, David, said, he said this, The Lord, now notice your capital L, capital O, R, and D, right? Um, that, if we were to read that in Hebrew, there would be four Hebrew characters there. Y-H-W-H. We'll insert the vowels because it's easier to say, but what is the word here? This is Yahweh. This is Jehovah. The Lord, Jehovah, said to my Lord, notice capital L, but lowercase O-R-N-D. That's the Old Testament word Adonai. Adonai. By the way, that's also God. See Genesis 18, verse 27, and Job 28, verse 28. How can Jehovah God say to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Hey, Mr. Pharisee, Mr. Sadducee, Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Herodian, can you explain this verse for me? That Jehovah God says to Adonai, you are David's boy. This is a powerful thing here. If Adonai is God, would you agree? They would say, yes, your theology is impeccable. Yes. How could God, Adonai, come from a human? That is to say, be descended from David. Remember how I said earlier that very likely the Apostle Paul is in this crowd. He is. My hunch, this hit the Apostle Paul hard. Good question. Can the God of all the universe come from a human? Was David's quote a misprint? What says Jesus, verse 34, therefore God calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Verse 45, then in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogue and the best places at the feast, who devour widows' houses. This is bad. They'll use their religious authority to make widows feel bad enough to get their money. Not good. And for a pretense, make long prayers. These will receive a greater condemnation. One last stop. Do you mind? Remember how I was telling you, Paul, we're done here in Luke. Let's now go to the book of, let's now go to the book of uh, Philippians. Paul, I personally believe, Philippians, please, chapter 2. I believe the Apostle Paul, that really hit him hard. That's a good question. 
How is it possible that the Lord God, who created everything, can come from a human? Philippians. Chapter 2. Paul eventually gets saved. Paul eventually gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Imagine that encyclopedic memory and database of all the Old Testament that he had, but spiritually blinded. Imagine once he truly gets saved, then all of that Old Testament comes alive. And I believe Paul went, ding, I know the answer. Philippians chapter 2, let's go to verse 5 and we'll end here. Philippians 2 verse 5. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. For being Jesus, being in the form of, that's the Greek word, huparkon. And it basically means same as. So what he's saying is, Jesus was the same thing of the same substance of the form of God. How is it that Jesus Christ, who was the same as God is, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of, and this is a fascinating word, no reputation. The Greek word here is kenoo, kenoo. If you didn't know, we read English translations of the original letters of correspondence, which were written in Greek. So we have to trust the translator's knowledge. I suppose that the translator's pen hovered over kenoo, and the verb form of this is kenosis. How are we going to translate that? Emptied. Jesus made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself, if you'll allow this cumbersome illustration. The star maker of Genesis 1 verse 1 said, I'm going to take off my star making tool belt and I'm going to leave it on a nail in heaven. I'm sorry, that's all that's coming to me at this time. That when he was here, kenosis... Jesus Christ was just like you and me. You're like, what? That's what he did. Mark in your margin here, John 5, verse 30, where Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. It is my Father working through me. Also write John 14, verse 10. It is the Father who does the work. Let's finish this, uh, this, this section. One more time, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. Well, what did Jesus think about? He was the same thing as God is because he is God. But he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. He left all of his star-making tool belt in heaven. And taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. This is so powerful. How could God come from man? Paul went, ding! Messiah, who is God, is fully human. And that's what all of that Old Testament prophecies about the suffering Messiah. That's a real head scratcher. The victorious Messiah in the thousand year reign, that's easy. Kicking butt and taking names. But what about the suffering dying Messiah? We can't, we got no place for that. And that was Jesus in Luke chapter 20 saying, you Pharisees and Sadducees, you better chew on that one because I'm going to be dead in a few days and three days after that I'm going to raise from the dead told you I was God amen let's all stand together thank you Lord Jesus try to settle and uh, work out the wigglies just a little bit and um, I don't normally do this but for concentration purposes could you lower the lights a little bit are you making a mood here, Steve? No, I'm just saying that sparkly things attract me. So I'm going to try to take the sparkles out for a minute because this is so crucial. 
Of all the times you could have been in a church service, here you are today when Jesus is talking about this fascinating, no human could have come up with theology. And here it is. God knew the humans are stuck in sin and there was nothing they could do to get out. All the other religions of the world, if you break them down, you had better jump through the hoops and climb the ladder of do's and don'ts and maybe a holy God may like you. Because that's what humans do. If I'm going to make up a religion that makes the most sense to me. Biblical Christianity is the only theology where a holy God came down to my sinful level and walked around in the same skin that I do. Wow. Why would he do that? A couple of reasons. There's nothing that you can experience here on earth that he didn't experience when he was here. He knew the pull and the tug of the flesh and the fleshly appetites. He knew about the deep pain of betrayal. He knew about being hated. And his crime, he just loved people. And he got murdered for it. Jesus knows every condition that you will ever know. And here's what he did. I'm paying for all of your sins anyway. Biblical Christianity, the kenosis. I'm going to walk around and experience life just like you and I do. I'm going to get depressed sometimes. There are times when I'm not going to have enough. There's times I'll have great joy hanging with people that I love. And then I'm going to experience debilitating almost stinging betrayal in the form of Judas. And then Paul's going to go, that is amazing. And later he's going to write, did you know that we have a high priest in heaven who is acquainted with all of our stuff? Everybody sit down, please, eyes closed. The kenosis. God came after you and rescued you right from where you are. You can't get to his level of righteousness Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. It's not available to the humans on a consistent basis. You're going to need supernatural relationship with him filling your heart to even taste a portion of that. Have you been wondering why you've had such a hard time and a time or two in your life you've even thought about cashing it all in? Well, Jesus says, I'm not going to let that happen until you hear this coconut tell you, I came to this earth, zipped up a human suit to find you and rescue you. And then I crawled on a cross willingly to pay for every one of your sins. And if you will just receive my free gift, then all of my holiness, fullness and beauty and light and love that I designed for you can finally be yours. But I'm not going to shove it down your throat. Everybody sit down. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you given him your life? Intellectually, has that made sense? God zipped up a human suit and paid for my sin. That's the brain part. Now the heart portion. Have you given and surrendered your life to him? He's not a bully. He's not going to shove it down your throat. He is simply knocking now on the door of your heart. I desperately want a relationship with you but do you want a relationship with me? Begin that relationship today, will you? Lord Jesus, yes. I want that relationship. Please save me from myself and my sin. 
I want to live forever with you in that new body I heard about coming soon. In Jesus' name, and now everybody said, amen. 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 If you'd like more questions on that, I'll put my mask on and we'll go over the whole thing again. God bless you. We'll see you on Tuesday night, everybody.